Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you all. Good morning. I'll give you just a second to find your seats. Good morning. Welcome to Temecula Hills. This morning, I'm going to begin the service by reading from Hebrews chapter 12. It should be on the screen there for you. This is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's worship together. Take these hands, I know they're empty, but with you they can be used for beauty in your perfect plan. All I am is yours. And take these feet, I know they stumble, but you use the Humble so Lord, please use me. All I am is yours. I give you all my life. I'm letting it go. A living sacrifice, no longer my own. All I am is yours. All How 
could we recount the ways you have multiplied our faith the wisdom of your ways the currents of your grace express in every moment every darkness and where we go you are there you are love you are all together good in the weakness of our faith in the silence where we wait you are here you're enough you are all together good joys and in our grace you have led us to be morning Temecula Hills. We're so glad to see you all here today. I always find it super joyful that whether we had a good week, maybe a bad week, we all had our own individual weeks, but we all get to come on Sunday to worship the same God. So I always think that's really awesome. Um, if you guys want to just go ahead and greet those that are around you, we'll say hi for a few minutes and then we'll have some announcements.
All righty, everybody, if we could all go ahead and take our seats. All right, so we do have a new women's Bible study that's going to be starting up on September the 13th. There was some feedback there. Um, it's a Tuesday night at the Bruda's house, and it's going to be um, complementing what we're learning here on Sunday mornings, um, just kind of about God's grace and his transforming power um, in all of his mercies. Um, it's going to be at 645 until 815, and it's going to be from September 13th until early December. If you have questions about that or you want more information, you can contact Mary Henderson. Saturday September 17th, 8 a.m., right here. Uh, men, we have another um, breakfast for us to be a part of. Uh, a little bit of f uh, food and, and time in God's Word together. You can sign up uh, in, on the scan code, or you can uh, sign up at the, uh, I don't know where Eric is, but sometimes we'll have our sign-ups back at the back table there so as well. September 18th, 8 a.m. Perfect. And then we have something new here. We used to have something for our connection lunches, so it's very similar, but we renamed it Explore the Hills, and it's going to be here at the church. So whether you're new or maybe you've been here for a little bit and maybe you just want to kind of know more about what Temecula Hills is, what we believe, who our leadership is, that's going to be um, on Sunday, September 18th. There'll be lunch here, and whether you have been coming here and you want to find ways to be connected or you're brand new or you're finding you know that you want to call Temecula Hills your home and you have some questions this would be a great opportunity for you to come and learn about our church I can't stop but think that when I hear Temecula, explore Temecula Hills is there a song that comes into your mind the hills are alive with the okay that's not I know but we're, it's just it's just that I couldn't in my, oh, okay, oh, okay, all right, all right. Anyways, that, it, that should be a pretty fun, fun time together, and then there will be a soloist, guest soloist. Uh, we're going to continue with our, our, our worship together um, by taking the offering, and this is just for our family members. If you're new to our, our church, we don't want your money. We are really glad you're here with us today. And um, we do have contact cards if there's some any special needs that you may have. As a family, as a person, we just fill that card out, put it in the basket as it comes by, and um, we'd love to be able to know and reach out to you if you'd like us to or to pray for your needs that you have. Um, but please take advantage of that if, you, if your um, heart's heavy or you're rejoicing as well. It's nice to see, I think, those positive things that we, we are rejoicing for different things in our, in our family as well. Um, the first Sunday of every month, we do uh, communion. And when we do that together, as we uh, remember the Lord's death and resurrection for our, our sin, we uh, have a benevolence uh, offering, and that goes to people in need. Um, so if you would be uh, moved to be a part of that, you can take, there's a little beige envelope in the back, or you can put on your, if, if you leave a check, you can just write, and let that's for the benevolence uh, fund, and that goes to a fund that is kind of, it gathers up, and then we have somebody that has some special financial needs that we can help, we, we get a chance to be able to do that. So just a great way of, uh, of helping in another way. We help people move, and then we can help them financially. We can help with meals, ministries, all kinds of different ways that we serve and help our body of, uh, body of believers, our family together here. So um, I think that's it. We'll have the guys come on forward, and, uh, and then uh, we'll pray for a continued part of our service. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. For the gifts that you have given to us, the gift of life, the gift of family, the gift of patience in a partner or a friend, the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, that died sacrificially on our behalf, who for the joy set before him endured that cross. And Lord, today I just thank you for the privilege we have of giving back to you things you already own, things you already have given us. But we are, uh, want to be a 
willing and active participant in this ministry you've given to us and on our hearts and our lives. We, we gladly give back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, good morning, church. So while we're collecting the offering, um, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes um, to actually introduce our home group leaders to our, our church. So if you are a home group leader, if you don't mind, if you would just stand for a quick second. I just wanted to put a name and a face to our home group meetings and um, just give, give an opportunity for our leaders to just mention their name, location, night they're meeting, and time real quick. After service, I'm going to be in the back and um, answer any questions you might, ha or you might have about home groups. Um, our purpose as a church is to bring glory to God by making and maturing disciples, and our home group ministry is our main way of doing that. So we strongly encourage everybody to be part of that. Um, we'll be meeting throughout the week, and um, going through the sermon questions on the back is a typical evening uh, when, you're, when you're with your home groups, and some home groups are a little different, and they do things a little differently. So just real quickly, um, I'll start with Chris and Susan, if you don't mind, um, and then we'll just kind of go around real quickly, and just, uh, again, quick introduction, and, and uh, where you meet, what time, and what's going on. Sorry. We're going to have an extension of the marriage conference that took place last weekend. We're going to extend that and offer once a month to anybody who wants to come to um, have a, like a Friday evening meeting and um, bring your kids. We're going to have dinner. We're going to have child care. And we're going to spend the evening together talking about marriage. Okay. And figuring out marriage and going through marriage. And we're just going to have a great time with that. And that's what we're looking at, it's roughly based so far. We're still shaping it out, but that's our goal and our idea. So, okay. So, questions about that? Look for Chris and Susan after service or talk to me back there. Hi there, Brett Brewer. Uh, me and, oh, yeah, hey, ha ha, yeah. They're in my home group. I told them to do that. Um, my wife, uh, Melanie, and I host a home group on Thursday evenings at 6 o'clock from 6 to 8. Um, we have child care. And, um, yeah, we're not doing Friday night dinners and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I am not the home group leader. My husband and his brother, um, Kyle and Cody, uh, we do a home group on Wednesdays at 630 I'm Nathaniel, and I do a home group, and we're going to be having it in Central Temecula, Crown Hill area. It's going to be on six at, uh, Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. this season, and so we'd love for you to join us. All right, I'll click over here. Uh, Jeff and Shelly Connor, along with Dave and Tammy Soto, hosting at our house, which is... Thank you, yeah, yeah. Um, on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. In Northeast Temecula. I'm going to speak for the Brutus since Christy and I are in the home group. It's Monday nights in south end of Temecula. Monday nights at uh, 6.30. So, um, again, those are our home groups. I think I've covered everybody. Um, well, the Haynes aren't here, and Tanya's probably not going to want to speak, right? Knowing Tanya. So, um, okay, here we go. I'm speaking for Tom Haynes, um, so you should look at me and think I'm about this tall. Yeah, and I don't have the Australian accent or the South African accent. Uh, we meet on Tuesday evenings at 6 p.m. And unlike most of the home groups, we actually are just going through the Bible uh, in, in book chunks. And we just every week sit there, read, talk, discuss, learn, talk, read, eat, discuss. Thanks, Tom. So if you have a phone, anybody have a phone? Yeah, thank you, Dave. So Bruce and Margie Campbell are actually in Hawaii right now, so they couldn't be here to represent their home group. But they're starting a new one. And that one's pretty special because that's actually, they're fairly new to the church. 
And they want to welcome anybody who's also new, you know, to come join them on their home group, okay? And I have their information also. It, this is in your uh, bulletin, um, that uh, QR code. And we're going to ask, even if you've been going to home groups for 18 years or whatever, please fill that out and just register anyway, just so we can know who's in which home group. That would be a big, big help. And if you're old school like me, there is a pen. You can also sign up on that clipboard. We do use clipboards still in the back, and I'll be there to answer any questions after service, okay? So um, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll continue our service this morning. Father God, we just uh, thank you so much for this church. We thank you for who you are, your love, and your mercy, and your grace in our lives. And Lord, I just want to pray for our home groups, our home group leaders. Um, thank you, Father, for just providing them. And uh, Lord, we just... Uh, count it a blessing to gather and, and, um, and meet uh, together as we can encourage one another in our relationship with you and also with this body. So we just thank you for that privilege each and every week. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you all stand with us as we continue to praise the Lord together?
Will you all stand, keep standing for the reading of the word? Thank you, Eric. Well, good morning. It is really nice to be in an air-conditioned room, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You know, in the 1500s, there was a monk named Martin Luther who discovered a truth that was stunningly happy news to him. And this truth caused Martin Luther to become a passionate reformer, and that passion stemmed from how his own life was transformed by that very truth. And it moved him from despair to delight. And this truth was not about moralizing, it was not about self-improvement, it was a truth that would transform the lives of millions of people and change the world. And the truth that he discovered was not a new truth, but rather an old truth that was firmly rooted in scripture, and yet a truth that had been obscured in his day. And of course, the truth I'm talking about is one of the battle cries of the Reformation, sola fide, faith alone that we are saved by faith alone. And today we are going to look at a passage of scripture that will allow us to us, whether Jew or Gentile, are under sin and due to receive God's righteous judgment and wrath for our wicked rebellion. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. But then we saw Paul make this decisive turn in the argument, this but God moment, when he shows us that through Jesus, God has made his own righteousness available to us through faith. As Romans 3.26 says, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then two weeks ago, Jeff taught us that because of this, because God saves us by faith alone, all the credit goes to God alone. The Jews have no ability to boast in their obedience to God's law. And today we're going to see Paul go back to the beginning of the Jewish people. 
And he's going to show us that from the beginning, God had a consistent plan of how we would be saved. And that plan was through justification by faith alone. And we're going to see three points this morning. First, we'll see how God's people were saved from the beginning. And then we'll see two implications that flow out of that truth. So a total of three points that help us explore justification by faith alone. So open your Bibles to Romans chapter 4 today. There's some Bibles on your chairs in front of you, hopefully, if uh, you don't have one with you. And there's some on the back table. Romans 4, we're going to be in chapter 4 the entire morning. So open up Romans 4. If you have my same Bible, it's on page 1054. You probably don't. Okay. So Romans 4, verse 1. It says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about but not before God. For what does scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Paul is a genius in his argument here. What he does is he takes us back to consider Abraham, who is quite literally the father of the Jewish people. Every single Jewish person can trace their ancestry to that one man, Abraham. And so Paul asks his fellow Jews, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? And then he explains why he's asking this question. He's continuing that discussion of boasting that he started in chapter 3. And so, so let me explain. Back in chapter 2, Paul mentioned somebody who boasted in the law. In chapter 2, verse 23, it said, You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. And then in chapter 3, just a few verses ago, back in 327, he says, What then becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. And you might be thinking, why all this talk about boasting? Was this really a big problem back then? And you've got to understand, the Jewish people thought of themselves as God's special, elect people. They had God's very law, God's very standards. And they thought of themselves as God's special people, with God's special standards. And that led some of them to have a boastful attitude. So we see this even in the, the Pharisee mentioned in Luke 18, where Jesus said this. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even a tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But, that tax, but the tax collector standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, and it's easy to read something like that and think, man, that is so foolish to talk to God like that. But the truth is, we can do the very same thing. We can look at other people around us who don't live by the same standards that we do and think, ah, oh, at least I'm not like that guy. Paul's point in this passage is to knock the legs out, out of that kind of attitude. And he does that by citing scripture. So look at verse 3. He says, for what does the scripture say? Okay, before we dive into what scripture says, I just want to pause for a moment and draw your attention to how Paul cites scripture here. First, he uses the singular form for the scripture. He sees the Bible as a unified whole, not a disconnected set of writings. Second, he used the word says. What does scripture say? That's a word you'd use of a person who's speaking. And so when Paul says that, it shows that he's making no distinction between what the Bible says and what God himself says through it. Third, he uses the present tense. He could have said, what, what was written? What has the scripture been written? But instead, 
He says, what does the scripture say in the present tense? Because Paul sees the Bible as the living and active word of God, that God's, in scripture, we have the living voice of God, and God is still speaking today to his people through the Bible. And finally, notice that when he asks a question, his immediate thought is to turn to scripture for authoritative guidance. Because in every controversy, in every matter of life and doctrine, scripture is the final court of appeal. The Bible is our authority, because in it we hear the very voice of God. Okay, that was a little bit of a tangent. But let's go back and read verses 1 through 3 again. It says in verse 1, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And what we find here is the first point on your outline. Abraham was justified or declared righteous by faith alone. And just as a reminder, the word justified means to be declared righteous in a judicial courtroom setting. And we're going to see that play itself out in this passage as we continue. Now, to understand this verse, it's really important to understand that word translated counted. In some of your Bibles, it may be translated as credited or reckoned. And those are good translations, too. This is an accounting term that was used mostly in financial and commercial contexts. And it signifies charging something to somebody's account. Paul uses the same root word for this in Philemon, verse 18, when it says, if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. That's the same word, charge. So what this means then is that something is counted to Abraham that does not inherently belong to Abraham. He is counted as righteous, though he is not righteous. He's declared to be in the right, though he is not in the right. He's reckoned to be clean, though he's filthy. And that is the miracle of what God does for us through the gospel. See, following the accounting imagery, what this is saying is happened is that Abraham had a negative balance due. He had sinned, and the wages of sin is death. So he had a payment due that he had no hope of ever repaying. He was in the red. But then he believed God, and, and what happened at that moment is God opened his ledger and crossed out the negative debt of sin, and in its place he wrote, Righteous. Abraham was counted to be righteous, though he was a sinner. This is what Martin Luther called simul justus et peccator, which means at the same time righteous and a sinner. God declares us to be righteous, not based on our own actions, not based on what we've done, not based on anything in us, but rather on the merits of Jesus. And so the miracle of the gospel is demonstrated in Abraham, that Abraham himself was not righteous, not perfect and blameless, but God treated him as though he was. It is possible to be loved and accepted by God while we ourselves are deeply sinful and imperfect because God counts us sinners as righteous through Jesus. And how does that happen? How was that righteous status given to Abraham? Look at verse 3 again. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. It doesn't say that Abraham was really committed to God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. It doesn't say that Abraham lived for God and loved God with all his heart, and it was counted to him as righteousness. It doesn't say Abraham believed God and then lived a good life, and it was counted to him as righteousness. No, it says he is justified by faith alone. 
You know, Genesis 15, 6 is the very first time that the word believe occurs in the entire Bible. And in this verse, belief or faith is the channel through which Abraham is declared righteous. Faith is the channel by which we are saved. And what is faith? Well, in Genesis 15, Abraham had been given a promise, a promise that his offspring would outnumber the stars in the heavens. So Abraham's faith, it wasn't just a general belief that God exists. It wasn't a general belief in God or that God's reliable. It was a specific belief in the promises that God had given to him. And so his faith had this objective content, but it also had this subjective trust in God. And in the same way, when you believe the gospel of Jesus, you believe the objective content of the gospel, the promises that God has given that we can be cleansed and saved through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but we also have subjective trust. We trust God at a personal level. And so there's a sense in which faith is synonymous with trust. But the word trust has more of a passive sense to it, whereas faith has an active sense. Faith is trust that is lived out and acted on. That's why Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Remember when Jesus is walking on the water, and Peter says to him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out to you on the water. Trust is believing in Jesus while you're on the boat. Faith is when you're stepping out of the boat onto the water. Faith is a living trust in God. So as you think about your life, do you have a living trust in God? Do you have a trust that is following God's lead? especially when God is leading you to a place that you were not expecting to go or you don't really want to go? Think about Abraham's life and how we see faith throughout his life. God told Abraham, go to a land I will show you. And he went because he had faith. He left his home. He left the familiar. He, left, he lived in a foreign, strange place. Hebrews 11.8 puts it this way. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He, he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in the tents with, in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Then God told Abraham that he would do something that seemed impossible, that though he had no children, no descendants, that his descendants would be as numerous as the dust of the earth, as numerous as the stars in the heavens, as numerous as the grains of sand on the seashore. Three different metaphors God gives to Abraham. And Abraham believed God. God told Abraham that when his wife Sarah was in her old age, she would have a child. And Sarah had Isaac when she was 90 years old. Maybe some of you couples think you're done having kids. Are you past 90? Who knows what God may do? Abraham believed God. And finally, God told Abraham to sacrifice his precious son, Isaac, the child that God had promised him. And what agony and wrestling of his soul Abraham must have gone through. And God never intended Abraham to actually sacrifice Isaac. No, instead he was testing Abraham, and he was having Abraham prophetically enact the judgment that God the Father would bring on his own son. Hebrews eleven seventeen tells us, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was 
in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said through Isaac shall your offspring be named, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Time after time, you see Abraham believing God, through, though his life is far from perfect, and you see him continually pressing into trusting God with his life. So let me ask you, how is God asking you in your life to press into trusting him? Is there a decision you're making? Is there a promise that God is asking you to trust? Is there a step of obedience that God is impressing on your heart to make? How is God asking you to live a life of faith in him? Abraham was justified, declared righteous by faith alone. And what Paul does as we continue in this passage is spells out two implications of this truth. And the first implication we see is this. Because justification is by faith alone, it is a free gift of sheer grace. Look at verse 4 to see this. It says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Have you ever worked, like, really hard on a job? Like, at the end of the day, you just, you're able to just, like, have that good, tired feeling where you just feel like, man, I worked hard, and it was, it was good work. My first job was working at the car wash that's by Winco. And back then, it wasn't Winco. It was actually Costco. So it worked out well. I could work, go get a $1.50 hot dog. It was great. And I remember working hot summer days, scrubbing the grime off of rims, cleaning out the inside of a car, making sure the windows were streak-free. And back then, I was making minimum wage, which was a little under $5 per hour. Um, and so for a full day's work, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., I'd make 40 bucks, and I was stoked. Now, can you imagine if after a full day's work, my boss came up to me and said, Nathaniel, I have a gift for you. I have a gift of grace from me to you. And then he proceeded to hand me my normal $40 paycheck. And he said, here, this is a gift. And he gave it to me. How do you think I'd feel about that? How would you feel about that? I'd say, wait a second. I don't think this is a gift because I earned that. I worked hard for that, right? And that's Paul's point in verse 4. He says, now the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And then Paul contrasts that with someone who does not work, but rather has faith. He says in verse 5, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. See, God doesn't justify the godly who work themselves up to be godly. He justifies the ungodly. That's talking about Abraham and me and you. And how does he justify or declare the righteous, to declare righteous the ungodly? Verse 5, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. What Paul is saying is that if we're saved by faith alone, then it's not on the basis of works. Instead, it's a free gift of God's grace to you. It's not that you work for it and then receive it as payment due as something that God owes to you. Instead, it's a totally free credit to your account that you did nothing to earn. It's unearned and undeserved. And so you don't have any bargaining chips with God. You don't have anything that you bring to the table. Nothing to the crop in my hands I bring, 
simply to the cross I cling. And then Paul continues to make this point by citing David, who wrote Psalm 32. And most people think that Psalm 32 is a time after David's sin with Bathsheba. And uh, notice how the word count is emphasized in this passage. Look at verse 6. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Who does David extol as being blessed, as being happy? It's the man against the Lord, whom the Lord will not count his sin. In the book Evangelism Explosion, James Kennedy suggests that when we share the gospel with someone, we ask them the question, suppose you were to die tonight and stand before God and God were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? You know, another version of that question might be, assume for a moment that there really is a heaven. What do you think are the general requirements for admission? Who gets in, who doesn't? You know, anyone who asks that question to a random sample of church-going people will be surprised at the large number who say one of three things. Either first, because I've tried my best to be a good Christian. Second, because I believe in God and I try to do his will. Or third, because I believe in God with all my heart. And this isn't a trick question. Instead, it's a, a diagnostic question that reveals misconceptions about what it means to believe and have faith in Jesus. The first answer, because I've tried my best to be a good Christian, is salvation by works. The second answer, because I believe in God and I try to do his will, is salvation by faith plus works. And the third answer, because I believe in God with all my heart, is salvation by faith as a work. It's when you have faith in your faith, not in Jesus. And in each case, the person may be religious, but they're still working at their own salvation. And in each alternative misses the glorious release offered in the gospel. And so these false understandings of faith can lead to insecurity and anxiety and a lack of assurance and maybe even spiritual pride and touchiness to criticism and a devastation when there's any moral lapse in their life. And because what's happened is they hasn't, haven't done a real transfer of trust where they've stopped trusting in themselves, they've stopped striving, and instead they put their trust in Christ. And so each of those answers was focused on, on self, on something that I did, something I achieved, I attained. And instead, the right answer is not because I did this or that. It's, because, it's not because I at all. It's because of him. Because he died in the cross on my place. In my place. He took the wrath that I deserved because he loved me and gave himself for me. And for some of us, maybe we've never actually really trusted in Christ alone for forgiveness. Or maybe for some of us, we, we did trust in Christ, but then we've been tempted to fall back into this works-based mentality. And this is something that often it happens just deep in our hearts. It's something we probably even catch if we ever had the conscious thought that we were earning something before God. But we subtly and almost subconsciously slip into a mentality of thinking that God owes me something for what I've done, for what I've given him or how I've lived. Or maybe thinking that God is unhappy with you for how you failed him. If you have put your faith in Christ, then your standing before God does not depend on your behavior. It depends on the finished work of Jesus on the cross. So let me ask you, what are you bringing to God in addition to your faith in Jesus? What do you look to that you think makes you acceptable before God? Maybe it's your pedigree or your ministry experience. 
Maybe it's your knowledge of theology or your understanding. Maybe it's how you've served other people through your job. Maybe it's just how you've been faithful over a long period of time when those around you have fallen away. Let me encourage you, stop bringing things to God to try to be acceptable and instead believe in the one who was the perfect acceptable sacrifice to the Father. Stop striving for faithfulness and trust in the faithful one. You see, if you don't understand the doctrine of salvation by faith alone, then you're always working to try to make yourself attractive and worthy. Martin Luther expressed the gospel this way. He said that failing, broken people are not loved because they are attractive. Rather, they are attractive because they are loved. See, God has loved us by sending his son to die for us. And when you trust in him, God changes you from the inside out and begins to make your life attractive as you follow Jesus. So we are saved by faith alone, and that means that salvation is a free gift of sheer grace. And the final truth in this passage, the second implication of being justified by faith alone, is this. Because justification is by faith alone, all peoples can be united through faith in Jesus. All peoples can be united through faith in Jesus. Look at verse 9 to see this. It says, Is this blessing then only for the circumcised, or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith it was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that, the righteous, that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. <coughs> now you might be thinking, okay, why does Paul bring up circumcision all of a sudden? Um, I heard a pastor talking about this, and he said when he was talking about it, they had somebody doing sign language, and it got really awkward, and they started doing the sign for circumcision over and over again. Anyway, uh, that was not in my notes here. <laughs> All right. So, Paul is making a very important and astute theological point. Let me explain. In, in, Re in Romans 4, 3, it said, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And that's Genesis 15, verse 6. And when was circumcision instituted? Genesis 17, which takes place about 14 to 29 years later after Genesis 15, 6. And I want you to think about this. After circumcision was given to Abraham, for about the next 430 years, circumcision was the only thing that marked out God's people. No law had been given, no Ten Commandments, no other commands from Yahweh. They had nothing other than knowing that our God is the God of Abraham, and eventually Isaac and Jacob, and, and he calls us to be set apart by being circumcised. And eventually, the Old Testament law was given to the people of God, and it would mark them out as, as being God's people, but that wasn't for 430 years. So in the meantime, circumcision functioned as this sort of proto-law, this law before the law. It was the only law they had until then. And so Paul's point is this. Was Abraham justified before or after receiving circumcision? And the answer is before. And so guess what? Abraham was justified when he was a Gentile, before he was circumcised, before he officially became a Jew. And so this means that salvation is by faith alone, 
by salvation, by faith alone, was a Gentile principle before it was a Jewish reality. So justification by faith alone is for everyone, Jew and Gentile alike. And this was a radical message for many of the Jews in Paul's day to hear. Look at verse 11 again. It says, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. See, circumcision was an Old Testament sign and seal of the spiritual reality that faith created. And what often happened at this time is instead of thinking of this external ritual as a sign and seal of that which faith offered, they started depending on the sign and seal even when they had no faith. It's like my wedding ring. On my wedding day, I made vows to my wife. I made vows to be tr faithful and trustworthy as her husband, to serve her and love her sacrificially, to keep my eyes and my heart exclusively for her, to be committed to her for the rest of my life. And then I gave her a sign and seal of my vows, a ring. And she made vows to me and gave me a ring. And I want you to imagine that I started really valuing my ring instead of the vows I made to my wife. Imagine that I started being very harsh and demeaning and hurtful to her. I wasn't cherishing her. I wasn't loving her as I had vowed to do. And then when I was called out on that bad behavior, I said, what do you mean? I got the ring on. I'm wearing this, aren't I? See, the sign and the seal has no independent value apart from the vows which it symbolizes. And in the same way, circumcision did not save Abraham. It was just the sign and the seal that he was already saved by faith alone. And we can do this very same thing. We confuse the fruit of our salvation with the root of our salvation. So that we were saved, good fruit starts to come out of my life, and then I start to depend on that good fruit. I put my trust in that good fruit. I think that good fruit is what's saving me and making me right before God. And is that what, how it is? No. That's not the root of my salvation. The root of my salvation is what Jesus has done for me on the cross. And then as Paul cashes out this argument, the big crescendo here is in verse uh, 11. He says this, The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised, who not merely were circumcised, but who walk in the footsteps of, their, of faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. What Paul is saying is Abraham's fatherhood is now expanded to include the spiritual paternity of all believers, all who believe, whether you're Jew or Gentile. So our faith in Christ means that Jews and Gentiles are brothers and sisters in Christ, equally children of Abraham, equally members of one body. And this is the basis for our unity as the church. We are united because we're saved by faith alone in the same Savior. And that means that you can have unity with people who don't look like you who don't act like you, who don't like the same things you like. You can be united to someone who you would never hang out with outside of Christ. You can be united to somebody who doesn't even like carne asada. Can you imagine that? You can be united with people who are annoying to you, with people who don't like the same things that you like. And let me tell you, Chad mentioned that we're launching home groups in the next couple of weeks, actually this week and next week, they'll be launching. And that's how we stay connected to one another as a church family. It's how we express that union with Christ. We meet together with people who aren't exactly like us, some people who we might not meet with otherwise, and we build into each other's lives and encourage one another and pray for one another and do life together as a community, and we are a church to one another in those groups. So home groups are an amazing and powerful way to live out this, live this out, and experience deep unity with other brothers and sisters in Christ who you might not otherwise hang out with or get to know. So Abraham was justified, declared righteous by faith alone, 
And because justification is by faith alone, it is a free gift of sheer grace. And all peoples can be united through faith in Jesus. As we close our service today, we're going to take time to remember that our salvation depends not on us, but on the finished work of Jesus on the cross by taking communion together. And when we take communion, we do so as an act of faith. We take the bread as a way of expressing our faith in Jesus' broken body. We take the juice as a way of expressing our faith in Jesus' shed blood. And let me warn you today, if you're not a Christian, um, if you haven't placed your faith in Christ, or if you have this unity with, within the body of Christ, do not take communion this morning. Let the bread and the cup pass. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27 says, <clears throat> Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself and then and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Paul says, and he's speaking to that church in Corinth, that some of them have become ill and died because they were taking communion in a way that was not honoring Jesus. They didn't show care and concern for one another. But if you put your simple faith in Jesus, you turn from sin and trust in him, then you can have confidence that you are forgiven and that his finished work on the cross stands, giving you righteousness. So the band is going to come forward, and as they do, um, take some time to examine yourself in this next song. And then I'll come back up, and we'll take communion together. The ushers are going to come and pass out communion, the communion elements, and there are gluten-free communion elements in the back if that's something that, that you need. You can grab those as we sing this next song. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving us. Thank you, God, for showing us the reality that we could never do anything to make up the debt of sin that we have incurred against ourselves. And thank you, Lord, that you sent Jesus to rescue us and give us hope that our hope is not found in ourselves, but is found in the finished work that you've completed on the cross. Father, I pray that you help us to simply trust in what you've done for us and to find joy and release and, and, and hope and new life in knowing you through what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Only 
song so much I almost forgot to come back up here. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23 it says for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you entered history and you went to a real cross and died in our place, taking our sin and our shame and bearing that for us. Thank you that you rose again and that we have hope and new life through your work on the cross. And Lord, may that spur us forward this week as we trust in you day by day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand as we sing this last song. I saw the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from every fear those who look on him are radiant and never be ashamed never be ashamed 
this poor man crying. And the Lord heard me and saved me from my enemies, the Son of God surrounds his saints, he will deliver them, he will deliver them. questions about our church i'd love to be able to talk with you a few quick announcements as we have a prayer team that meets over here if you need prayer if there's something going on in your life we can pray for you you can come meet with them they'd be happy to pray with you you can also always put a, a card in the box in the back table and we will be praying for you as a church um, also our refreshments the donuts are not melted because they are in there today since it's like 400 degrees outside so get the the donuts in there and home group signups are in the back so come check out that table if you have any questions chad will be back there to answer them have a great sunday <laughs> 